All right, so in the last video, we talked about how you can use probability to look at the outcome of potential genetic cross. Video prior, we talked about Punnett squares. Um, now we're gonna talk about pedigrees, which is another way that you can look at the outcome of cross. And if you hear a light grumble in the background, it is my dog who's letting me know that there is a cat in our yard and the cat may or may not bring the apocalypse, so I apologize. All right, so pedigrees. Let's look at symbols for pedigrees. This again is something you may have seen in the past. And they are family trees that are written in such a way that you can see genetic information on them. In pedigrees, when you see a square, filled or unfilled, square always denotes that that individual was born a biological male. A, a circle tells you that that individual was born a biological female. Now, when they're colored in, that shows you that whatever trait is being represented in that pedigree is seen in that individual. Here you see where it says affected male, affected female. It means that that individual has the thing. It's not necessarily an illness. Maybe in this case you're tracking freckles, um, but sometimes it can mean an illness. Note it says that that individual has that trait. It does not necessarily tell you if that individual is homozygous dominant um, or recessive or heterozygous for that trait, just that they show it. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. It's a little cold. When you see the diamond shaped, it means that that individual, their gender is unknown biologically unknown. That can mean you knew there was another sibling, but you don't know anything about them. That can mean that there was a miscarriage and that baby was um, passed before it um, was assigned its biological sex. Like we didn't, we didn't know a lot of times in miscarriages unless it's very late in the pregnancy. Women have no idea if they miscarried a boy or a girl. They just know that they miscarried a child. So that's what that might denote. Um, if the shape has a diagonal line through it, that shows you that um, that individual has passed away. Doesn't tell you how they died, but it does tell you that that individual has died. When you have two individuals that have a single horizontal line between them, that means that they mated, not necessarily that they married, but that they mated, and then any lines that branch off from them. So in this case, you see black square, open circle, there is a line between them, and then it tees down to those three individuals. Those are their offspring. They have a daughter that is affected, a son that is not, and an unknown child. So look at that son that is unaffected. You can see he is connected to an open circle. That individual, that female, doesn't have whatever trait that we're tracking. And we know that the unaffected son and the open circle had twins. The fact that they branch off um, in that A shape with the line between them means that they were identical twins. If they had branched off with that A shape and there wasn't a line between them, you didn't have the bar on the A, those would be twins that were not identical. So those are the different ways that you can show pedigree. Some pedigrees um, start to look a little interesting. You see in some royal family pedigrees where they have lines going between generations and things that denote um, maybe that siblings have mated or that siblings have had offspring with aunts or uncles or grandparents. I realize that sounds a little cringy, um, but the Egyptian family, the Ptolemaic Egyptian family, for example, has quite the active uh, pedigree. <laughs> this pedigree is a little interesting. So we have an affected father and we see his unaffected wife in the first generation, or if we're using Mendel's terms, the P generation. In the F1 generation, we can see that those two individuals had one child and it is heterozygous recessive. Therefore, the mom, the circle labeled two, must have been heterozygous and just didn't know it. That affected individual um, married a woman who is also heterozygous, and we can see three children who branched from that union. We have a female who is unaffected, she's a heterozygous. We have a male that we don't know his zygosity, and then we have an affected male. The AA affected male had a child, um, or excuse me, an affected female, I apologize. The AA affected female had a child with a spouse, um, who didn't have the disease but must have been heterozygous because their kid had it. That other daughter who was heterozygous had um, 
a husband who is heterozygous, one of their kids got it. One of their kids isn't actively showing the disease, but very well may be a carrier. And we see that a question mark square in the middle is um, a man who does not have it. They're not homozygous recessive, uh, but we don't know if they're heterozygous or not. So you can kind of track diseases this way, track affected traits, or you can do the math and run it through that way. So those are three different ways to look at um, genetic illnesses within families. Everything that we've done thus far, however, has only been tracking one trait. You can, of course, track more than one trait. If you track two traits, that's a dihybrid cross, monohybrid, mono means one, a dihybrid cross, di means two. So in this instance, we're looking at parents who have two different, um, or two phenotypes that differ, and we're gonna track two traits at the exact same time. This is a little bit different because we have to consider all of the potential gametic pairings and that's how we make our Punnett square. So in this case, we're tracking a yellow round seed. So it's big Y, big Y, big R, big R. And we're gonna mate that with a green wrinkly seed. So that's a little Y, little Y little r, little r, and that's the P generation. Well, we know that every offspring is gonna end up big, little, big, little, big Y, little Y, big R, little r, because that's the only option. Every baby is gonna get one big Y from mom and one little Y from dad, one big R from mom and one little R from dad. So that one's easy. The second generation, however, is a little bit more complicated to figure out because everybody can get different mixes from their parents because you get a Y from each parent and an R from each parent and they travel together at some point in time in the individual gametes. So if you are big little, big little, that means that in some of your gametes they will randomly receive big Y, big R. Some of your gametes are randomly going to receive little y, big R, some of them will randomly receive big y, little r, and some of them will randomly receive little, little. In this case, the other, um, the other parent is identical, so it gives you big, big, little, big, big, little, and little, little. And you blend all those things together and you actually do the process of the Punnett square the exact same way. You put each of the potential gametic pairings at the top of each column heading, you put the other parent's potential genetic pairings as your row headings, and you drag your information across. I always think about it, if you think about Excel when you're dragging like columns down and rows across, it's the exact same com um, concept, only usually when you're doing genetics homework, you're doing it on paper. And then you end up counting your phenotype and genotype ratios exactly the same way as you did um, when you counted in your monohybrid squares. Look at all of your potential genotypes, see how many individuals have each one, look at all of your potential phenotypes and see how many individuals had each of those. And you can see the outcome of the cross in this picture and then they go in more detail in your book. Oops, I apologize. So Mendel's second law of um, genetics is referred to as the law of independent assortment is seen in this cross actually because just because a parent gives a dominant allele for one trait, that does not mean that that parent has to give the dominant allele for the other trait. Just because I gave you my green seed color does not mean that I have to give you my wrinkly seed coat. Those things travel independently, and that's why we had to make sure that our column headings and our row headings accounted for all of the potential pairings that we could have come, because those two things are not linked to one another. And that's the law of independent segregation. Everybody splits independently of one another, and you might be thinking, yeah, but it seems like some traits um, go together a lot. Every time I see a redhead, they have blue eyes, um, or they have green eyes, rather, and when I see someone with blonde hair, the chances of them having blue eyes seem to be pretty high up there. There's a reason for that, and we'll touch on it at the end of the lecture. It should be noted that not all traits work this prettily. <laughs> they don't all work that well. Um, some plants have incomplete dominance. We started with the discussion of snapdragons. 
Um, so when you consider snapdragons, it's pretty neat if you cross a true breeding red plant with a true breeding white plant, so that means that you cross a big R, big R with a little R, little R, what you end up with are all pink babies. In incomplete dominance, you see a mixing of traits rather than um, the classic, you're either red or white. So we mentioned previously that you have these mixes sometimes, and this is an example of that. Not all genetic traits, or not all genetics outcomes are as perfect as the ones that Mendel showed with his pea plants. Sometimes there are multiple alleles that can affect the dominance um, seen in a different trait. So depending on how your alleles come together, you might see different um, phenotypes. Here's a really great example in these particular bunnies. If you're C, big C, big C, you have brown fur. If you're a little C and you have um, a different gene that's denoted with a CH, if you have two of those CHs, then you're black. But the, or you have white fur, but the tips of your fur happens to be black. If you have a recessive gene with a special allele denoted with an H, that bunny will be Himalayan. And if you have two recessive genes and that bunny happens to be white. So there are a lot of different ways, a lot of different outcomes for genetic variability that are not seen in the classic work of Gregor Mendel, but we can expand on them um, as we dive into our study of genetics. There are even some traits that get even weirder than that, and that's because they have mutations. And sometimes we see um, mutations that can be homozygous dominant. So if you have one mutation, um, that's the trait that you're going to see. And other times we have mutations that work just like recessive genes. The outcome of all of this is just that you should know that just because you have a specific um, genotype, Sometimes we're going to look differently. Mendel's outcomes were in a very perfect, very idealized world. Sometimes we find actually that having certain mutations or strange traits actually isn't a bad thing. Um, for example, we have found that if you have a trait for a disease called sickle cell and it makes um, your red blood cells look sickled, they appear curved, it find, um, what we find is that the curvature of your red blood cells means that you're far less likely to be infected with the disease, diseases like malaria. The plasmodium that causes the illness physically cannot get into your red cells. So sometimes we see really high rates of traits and we don't really understand why until we truly dive into what's going on in different populations to see the mechanisms that might drive some um, genetic advantages that aren't immediately obvious. Because if you're a carrier for sickle cell, there's a greater chance that your kids will have sickle cell, but it can actually mean good things for you. Some traits are sex linked and that makes it even more confusing. Um, for example, the gene for eye color is located on the X chromosome of Drosophila melanogaster flies, which is what you see down here. So you can only have certain eye colors if you are a certain sex. So it gets really interesting. Um, you can see how that works here. You can only have the red eye color um, if you are a female because you need... Um, uh, Sorry, you can only have the red eye color if you're a male. My mind went completely blank. Or it's very, very, very rare to have females that have red eye colors because you need two X's that are affected in order to have the red eye color, whereas a male only needs to have one X that's affected, of course, because XX makes you a female and XY makes you a male. We see more issues with these link disorders in human beings. So in women, again, XX means that you're female, XY means that you're male. And if there's a disease, for example, that's carried on the X chromosome, a female would have to get two bad Xs, have two sick parents with the same illness in order to show the illness herself. Whereas a male might only have to have one bad X in order to show that illness um, himself. So most of the time when you have sex-linked traits, you see them in men, but not in women. There are some lethal alleles. So some alleles are so non-functional that if you have it, you die, which is very sad. Um, but sometimes having a lethal allele um, means that you might have some interesting traits. So minx cats that are heterozygous for a specific allele don't have tails. 
If you're heterozygous, you will survive. If you are homozygous dominant for that allele, that kitten will actually never be born. Um, those crosses that we've been doing can get even more confusing. You can do them with three traits uh, rather than just two traits. When you do them with three traits, what this is showing you is that it is far easier to do the math um, and multiply your odds together than it is to draw out uh, an extremely large Punnett square and try to keep track of everything. I mentioned a little bit earlier that sometimes it seems like some genes just always travel together. I told you that genes are not linked. Well, as it turns out, that's correct but not correct. Genes, as we now know, are located on different loci of chromosomes. Sometimes those locations are right next to one another. So the chances of those genes traveling together is pretty stinking close. So in this example, a and B are closer together than A and C. So if you're cutting this chromosome at random places, the chances of you getting A and B together in a piece are pretty high. The chances of you getting A and C together in a piece are pretty low because those are pretty far apart. So when you notice that you have traits that seem to occur really often are far more commonly together than they do apart, it's probably due to their loci on a chromosome. Last but certainly not least to throw one final wrench in our study of genetics is epistasis. In epistasis, there are certain genes that are not independent, but rather they interact with one another in order to produce certain phenotypes. The example here is the mottled color in um, mice. And what we see is when you have certain certain mixes of genes, you end up with colors that you wouldn't get without that very fancy proportion. We won't go crazy with epistasis because it's kind of a topic on into itself, but know that your, ge your genes don't exist in a vacuum. They often interplay and it makes for a very cool genetic outcome.